Yeah. Um, before we get started, I um, just want a couple of things everyone that's here can understand. Your questions, come up to the podium, ask the questions. Um, you know, instead of passing the mic around. And the second item is, any trustees that's here cannot ask questions. They can observe and listen, but we can't engage, any elected official can't engage, as this is, it would be an open meeting that violation. But uh, outside of that, because we're not taking notes, we're not taking any type of, uh, minutes, anything to that nature. So, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Finch, if you want to get started. Um, thank you all for attending this evening. I know we have things we could do on a nice, warm Thursday evening. So um, hopefully I'll be able to address and answer some of your questions that you may have. What I want to do with this um, first meeting that I've had with you all is to give you a brief recap of what I've worked with the finance department to do in the last year that I've been here um, and just give you guys an update on what's going on in the finance department and again answer any questions that you might have. Some of you guys have like an outline of some bullet points that I think might be important to the village and to the residents. So let me get started. Um, the first thing is um, the re village revenue. Over, overall, the village revenue is pretty much in a good, strong state. As of April of this year, sales revenue is roughly up $63,000 from last year. In the, with the addition of the gas and wash, we have additional $278,000 um, from TIF money because of the gas and wash in that location and development which um, as you guys become the board meetings, you know that money is going to be allocated to um, things over in that particular area for like road improvements and things of that nature. In the past, we used to do what is called a tax anticipated warrant. Um, that was one of the first things that I changed when I got here last year during the fall, I mean during the summer. Going and having a tax anticipated warrant normally costs the village $45,000 annually and again, like I said, this has been going on for several years. Um, and what will happen is, a tick, tax, uh, it's called a TAR, tax anticipated warrant will be taken out for roughly $500,000 at the tune of about $40,000 in expenses. What I did last year was get a line of credit um, and replace it at $500,000 tax anticipated warrant. And that only cost the village roughly $275. So I did that last year. And I did that again this year. So that, off, just making that slight change, saved the village $90,000. $90, Over the last few months, um, myself and the finance department has eliminated some of the vendors that was um, extra vendors that we didn't need, it, need, such as Verizon bills. We had triple, three or four different um, internet companies that we did not need that um, over years have cost the village some money. There's still some other vendors that need a detailed analysis done so that um, the village is not paying duplicate for the same services. One of the things that has helped the overall revenue of the village is that with the housing registration, which is through a company called ProChamps, the vacant housing list has recently been updated the last month and a half, two months, and we are um, trying to have the banks register those houses. Once the bank registers a house, they pay the village $250 every six months. In addition to that, the next process that we're working on is any water that was on that particular house that has not been paid, we are working on the process even going directly after to the banks or putting a lien on those particular um, houses that we know have an outstanding water bill. Um, one of the things that I think we in the finance department are probably most proud of, we have a major increase in the water revenue. Last year, you guys remember, we had some bumps in the road with some of the policies and procedures that I implemented in the water department. But since that time, we have gotten a, a consistent flow of water being collected from the residents. So that's a, a tribute to working and putting policies and procedures in place. In addition to that, we have 
um, our coal department that has used to write tickets and fines throughout the village, and those tickets and fines sometimes would get paid and sometimes wouldn't get paid. We are working aggressively with a company, um, actually with the state of Illinois, called Local Debt Recovery to um, go after people, tax returns, if they have fines and tickets that they have not paid for years. And so that's another area of revenue increase that you will see once the um, numbers are all final. I know a big concern that the residents have mentioned over the last several months is regarding two of our audits. One is the village audit and the other one is the forensic audit. Um, one of the concerns that the audit here, based on um, several years of audit reports, is an outstanding checklist. That has now been implemented where we run um, pretty much an outstanding checklist once we do an AP list. The importance of that is to be able to know what checks is still out there that has not been cashed. What used to happen was checks that was out there that has not been cashed would come in and be cashed and then a bank account would inadvertently go into um, insignificant funds. Another thing that we have started, again, we had bumps in the road over the last year on policies and procedures that I implemented, was the um, new accounts payable process. If you all remember, we changed how the format looked. Um, we had a few concerns that uh, residents and trustees were not getting that information. Um, since that time, the uh, implementation of the accounts payable list has been working well. Um, AP lists get put out every two weeks, agent reports get put out every two weeks, and then the files for those particular vendors that we are paying is on display for any um, trustees to look at. The, uh, another concern that the auditors had um, was credit cards. One of the credit cards that was in the village um, when I first got here, I canceled that credit card, so that eliminates some of the issues with um, in individuals of the staff using credit cards. Um, one of the biggest things that we did, in addition to collecting water um, revenues, past water revenues, we used to have roughly 800 estimated readings. Now that number is roughly down to about 125 estimated readings, and we're still working on the kinks to getting that down to pretty much to zero. And now we've also, like I said earlier, started um, consistently cutting water off once a month, roughly the same day each, each month. And that way it provides some consistencies to the residents and also it prevents um, residents from getting so far behind on their bills that it makes it almost impossible for them to catch up. The other thing that we've done that was concerned with the audit, auditors was the pension fund. As you guys remember last year, um, pretty much the pension boards, fire and police was willing to go to the state to withhold all of our revenues. Um, myself working with the pension board presidents or the fire and pension, we worked out a uh, somewhat a agreement, handshake gentleman agreement, where the village would start paying money in, into the pension board in addition to the tax levy. So far, um, having kept my word with the temp two pension board, that letter is now ceased and um, it is no longer going to the state. So that's a big burden off the, um, the village. The other thing that we have consistently done is pay majority of our vendors within 45 days. There's a few vendors that might be paid later than that, and that has to do with the cash flow. Um, I'm very big on managing cash and not just spending, sending out money just for the sake of sending out money, but understanding what bills have to be paid in the future. And the only way you can do that is understanding when and what amount of cash is coming in. Um, we discussed last year about grants. I, I did some research with some grants and it was found out that a couple, well actually one particular grant was placed in an inappropriate account and eventually we subsequently, the village had to pay that money back to the state. So that, have been, that has been uh, rectified and no longer um, an issue. Um, another concern that the auditors have, if you look at the audit reports, we used to have a lot of audit-adjusted uh, audit entries and basically what that means is, once the auditors look at the financial statements of the village, um, they deem things are done incorrectly, they will go in and make a list of entries that need to be done correctly. And previously, that number ran over 150 different entries. So what we've been trying to do over the last year is minimize that. So, so I'm hoping that once the new audit report comes out for 2020, we'll see a major decline in how many entries the auditors have to do, because the more entries they do, the more money we have to pay. 
Um, you guys heard me mention several times, we have over 30 bank accounts in the village. In my personal opinion, don't know why we needed that many. So I've been trying to eliminate some of those accounts. Um, I'm working now to eliminate three or three more accounts because among the 30 plus bank accounts, we have like five different banks. So that's, um, again, something that put extra stress, stress and burden on the staff to try to manage and keep up with 30 plus bank accounts. So we're working on eliminating those bank accounts. The other thing that I worked on is the uh, DEA account. That was not reconciled to the satisfactory of the DEA office out of New York. So myself and Chief White spent some time to reconcile those numbers and get everything clarified for the DEA account. Now that's um, has been resolved. There is no issue with the DEA account. The other auditor that we work with in the residents and members of the body asked about and was concerned was the forensic audit. As you guys know, I made recommendation for a couple firms last year. We do have a firm now working on the forensic audit. As I mentioned then, and I mentioned now, that that's a process that takes some time. But I have been in talk with the forensic auditors um, probably at least once a month. Um, and um, recently, I just talked to them a couple days ago. They should be here, if not in person uh, or on a conference call on the 17th, I think, or the 18th, I'm sorry, the 18th. So that process was started back in February of this year. One of the things that they're looking at is the adjusting entries that I mentioned earlier that was identified by the auditors um, because basically that concern is why is our auditors making entries that our county department should be doing themselves. The other things that they're looking for, and I mentioned this through uh, my time here, they look into uh, policy and procedures. As, as I mentioned before, that's something that is very lax in the finance department, policies and procedures. So that's something that they're going to um, pretty much address. The other thing that they're going to address is the CNA Railroad. For some reason, when that account was established, it was um, money moved to another, from one bank account and then set up a second bank account. So the question that I'm trying to find out is, as well they're going to try to find out is why was it put into two different bank accounts? Um, that's one of the issues that we have. Like I said, we have five different banks, which I don't know why that was established years ago, but that's something that um, needs to be consolidated. During uh, my time here, I decided to uh, do an IMRF audit. IMRF is the audit was pertaining to current and previous previous employees retirement account. So I did that in maybe the fall of 2018. Um, one thing, one reason I did that was because I noticed we was issuing checks uh, for IMF payment, but also having those same payments drafted out of the bank account. We have since stopped that process of issuing checks. We have it drafted out of the bank account before the due date. And the reason that's significant is because if you go past the due date, you pay penalties on that money. The reason I wanted to do um, IMF audit, um, if you guys recall, back when I first got here, we had to pay a, a $35,000 fine for IMF or so for an issue that um, we caused, the village caused. So that would make me decide to trigger um, the IMF audit. And since that audit, we found two individuals um, with issues regarding your retirement that we have to address. One has been resolved, the other one we're still working, because um, it's kind of unique in itself, we still work with the IMRF team to find out what's the best way to approach this with our um, um, payroll system. Um, the other thing is, I'm currently working with an uh, uh, employee, IMRF, to reconcile her IMRF from 2016. Um, Thankfully, the person is, is being patient with me as we go back and reconcile her their um, paychecks and make sure that they're balanced to what should be recognized by IMRF. One of the things we have a major concern about that I've heard a lot in the last few months is the budget. This is, a, I guess, an issue, a touchy issue. The budget is not done. Um, the budget was started back in April. I've met with the department heads, all of them, by the middle of June. I met with all the trustees by the middle of July. I originally had the schedule for the budget to be completed by the end of July. As I said last year, and I'll say it again this year, 
This is the first village that I've ever worked in that I have not gotten the budget done by the end of July. Personally, it's embarrassing to myself because I know that uh, it should be unacceptable for anybody. But I can't always be 100% on my ability to get something done. One of the challenges that is holding up the budget is that our trustees wanted to wait and do job description reviews. So that, to me, has nothing to do with the expenses or revenue of a budget. But that's the reason why, in my opinion, it's not done, because I personally was told it won't get approved until job description are approved. So until that's happened, there was no need for me to set up meetings. One thing I do not like to do is waste my time. I'm not having a meeting just to sit and talk, because for whatever reason, we have four or five hours meeting, and at the end of the four or five hours, we're at the same place we was at an hour ago. So that's why you're not seeing a consistency of meetings, because no need to have a meeting to waste time. Now, the latest thing that has been brought to people's attention is the Treasury report. Yes, I missed the Treasury report. Now, what is not true that's been out there, the missing the Treasury report deadline does not, is not, will not cost the village any money. What will happen is that the county potentially would hold back property taxes. Doesn't mean you'll never get it. It just means they will hold it back until they get the Treasury report. Now, now, I take full ownership of not having the Treasury report done. But for those that think I forgot, or for those that think because they said something a week ago, I hurry up and did the Treasury report, and that is not true. I started the Treasury report back in March. If you guys remember what happened back in March, we had COVID. During that time in COVID, as well as you guys know, I'm a VA for Linwood. I went through a process of laying people off in Linwood, and we had issues here in Salt Village, and it slipped my mind. So to prove that I'm not lying about when I started the Treasury report, I have an email that I sent to myself dated, I think, March 26, of me working on the Treasury report. So don't think because somebody at the last minute told me to do the Treasury report that I heard and did it. I know my job, and I know my job very well. So please don't assume that I rushed to get this done in the last week. I simply forgot because we have so much other stuff that does not pertain to finance going on in the finance department, and it was something that I just slipped and left in my Excel file. The water fund. This one here, I'm the most proud of. I'm curious to see how it would be once I leave Salt Village. But just to give you a snapshot of what the finance department has accomplished. And this again, is, everything that I say is verifiable. In May 2018, the water count had about $56,000 in it. As of April 2019, the water count had $557,000 in it. As of August, the last month, we have $1.2 million in that water count. That's a tribute to cash management. That's a tribute to the assistant finance director, as well as public works, and then the IT, and the accounts payable person because we aggressively went out there making sure people pay the water bill. So if nothing else, that's the biggest uh, achievement that I have since I've been in, in Salt Village, to know that there's over a, a, one, a million dollars that have consistently been in the water account that we have not used except for maybe a month ago because of COVID, I had to borrow $400,000. Now, regarding cash flow, you can't pay bills if you don't have cash coming in. You can't pay bills if you don't know what, when and where cash is coming from. So as I said earlier, I did do a line of credit for $500,000. Not only did I do a line of credit for $500,000, the $800,000 that was given to us be from gas and wash, every single bank account earned less than zero, I mean 0.025%, basically no money. So as of now, that same CD that was earning no money, I mean same $800,000 that was earning no money, has earned over $20,000. Um, again, like I said, I've only used the water fund once this year. Back in April and March of this year, I mentioned to the board that because of COVID and lost revenues from the state, we potentially might have to borrow money. So subsequently, I did borrow $400,000 out of the water fund. I think that in itself is a uh, contribution and a, a testament to managed cash because as you guys have stated numerous times, Water fund was tapped into forever. 
and this is the first time in at least 12 months, no, it's about 16 months that it has been touched. The other thing is, um, like I said, vendor invoices and agent report, that is provided to the trustees every two weeks. Um, again, last year was all about transparency, so there's no reason that no one knows what bills getting paid, no one knows what department hits um, authorized bills, because that has been provided consistently for at least the last nine to 10 months. Um, bank balances, currently what we have in the bank is also provided every two weeks, so no one can question how much money we have in the bank at any given time. And then as I said before, the 800,000 is in a CD that is secure for one year. We would have to go through a process to break that CD, so there's no way we can just tap that money without somebody from the bank notifying the corporate authorities that the CD about to be broken. Fire hydrant. Fire hydrant was the very first issue that was brought to my attention back in February 19. Unfortunately, as of today, we still have roughly 67 fire hydrant. That's not because I didn't do my part as far as allocating the money for the fire hydrant to get fixed. That I put that in the 2020 budget as well as the 2021 budget. I might can allocate the money, but what I cannot do is go fix the fire hydrants. I'm waiting on Trustee Brewer, public work director, and his staff to start working on the fire hydrant. Unfortunately, my recommendation was to outsource that. I got pushed back because it was going to quote unquote be a union grievance. Personally, I don't understand. If the job can't get done, how does the job get done if the workers can't do it? Now, what I'm going to hear, and I've heard it since I've been here, they're understaffed. Let me say once again, you guys know I'm a village administrator for Linwood. Linwood has seven public works directors. Of the seven, we do not have a public works director. He's been gone almost two years this October. Of the seven, we have two new foremen within the last 30 days. Of the seven, we have two new public works in employees that have been there less than six months. I challenge anyone to drive around Linwood and tell me how much is still left undone in Linwood and, comp and compare it to the fire hydrants in Salt Village. So when you tell me it's a manpower issue, I find it hard to believe. Because if I put it in a budget and you have the money to do it, you either get your manpower to do it or you find an option to get it done. If we're gonna make excuses, then make excuses for all departments. Because again, um, it was the first thing brought to my attention. I recommend how I should get fixed, and a year later, my recommendation fall on deaf ears. We have water policy. This policy, I did work with one of the trustees to implement it. it is, it's a contribute to why we do have money, in the, one of the reasons we have money in the water count now because we changed the way investors was coming to the village and getting money, I mean getting water. Basically the way the process worked in the past, an investor would come in on a Monday, say he need water for five days, which would be like that Friday. No one works, let's say, on Saturday and Sunday, of course. Monday, the assumption would be made that that investor would turn the water off. Well, what we found in the uh, finance department, that the water was never really turned off. So a year later, two years later, three years later, we found accounts that was having water, but wasn't paying a water bill. That has somewhat sim since has been changed. Again, it's one of those things that has caused roughly some feathers with the investors. But if you want people to pay what they use, it shouldn't matter whether they're homeowners or investors. It's what, if you use the revenue, I mean the uh, services, you should pay the revenue associated with it. So we are working to collect more of the past due accounts, because when I got here, we had roughly 125 past due account that totaled over $300,000 in past due water bill. That number has significantly dropped, and we uh, consistently try to stay on top of that to not let anybody get a, a, a $1,000 water bill. Um, the next item, bullet point again, I mentioned about the interest rate. Prior to me coming here, all 30 bank accounts was at less than 0.025%. Now they had. 2% and just in one account alone, we earn over $20,000. That doesn't include the um, uh, motor fuel account, that doesn't include the general account. So the interest rate total, interest earned based on, based on that 2% interest rate is definitely more than $20,000 within the last year. Number 11, pay issues. <clears throat> Again, this was a very um, heated conversation throughout the year that I've been here. 
As you all know, we did eliminate a former consultant in FY20. One of the things that came up recently in the last two months that I strongly uh, objected to was finding ways to pay two consultants, potentially, or one, well, one of the two, um, anywhere from eighty to $120,000 for part-time work. Uh, we do have issues with two staff that was um, pay was adjusted in the FY20 budget and it was not canceled until later this year. So that was a big issue among the body. And the reason that was not changed because it was a lack of follow-up and it was a lack of individual having the experience to understand how to function in that particular role. Changing someone's pay is not, will not, and was not my responsibility. The reason I say is not, was not, and will not be my responsibility, again, go, if you read the audit reports, it's a thing called segregation of duties. I cannot be the finance director and the HR director at the same time. So if we're going to point blame, put blame on the task on an individual that the, the body chose to hire that you had the experience to know how to function as an HR personnel. Number 12, again, I mentioned about IMRF audit. We have two members that had to be adjusted. One of the uh, overpayment we could not correct because of the timing. It was past due when uh, it was brought to my attention. So when I worked with the IMRF representative, we were not able to go back and make that modification. So that's a bill that unfortunately the village has to eat. Health insurance, again, I mentioned this last fall, we did make a fine payment for a fine to IRS because health insurance was done improperly from um, previous individuals. And by the time it came to my recollection and notice, it was past due and we could not modify that one as well. But for this year, we did reduce the premiums to all employees. We have a few unhappy employees at the moment, but overall it saved every employee in their paycheck. In addition, it saved the village about $40,000 annually. Number 14 is about the water billing. As you all know, we implemented, implemented um, a water billing system from two months postcards to once a month um, billing. We still have some kinks to work out of that, but overall, the design behind that was to, one, provide a lower monthly water bill due for the residents, two, to eliminate a staff taking eight hours to rip postcards up take it to Chicago Heights Mill, for, take that back. The process was the person would take the postcard, rip them in half, put them in stacks of 100, put them in rubber bands, put them in a binder, take the binder to Chicago Heights, and then wait two weeks and send out reminder notice. That process was definitely inefficient and a waste of employees' time and money, in my opinion. So we implemented the water bill system which roughly costs anywhere between three fifty to four hundred dollars a month, depending on the uh, amount of paper and the water bills. Um, over, so overall review, just a quick recap. I'm working with current administration staff. The village has received at least one hundred ten thousand dollars in lost revenue. Again, like I said, there's consistently been over a million dollars in the water count. I prevented a pension lawsuit. I've streamlined outdated water system. We reconcile the drug enforcement account with the police chief. We provide vendor lists and invoices to the trustees for review. We work to have more um, bank register their vacant property and pay a fee to the village. I did identify the $250,000 to pay a bond payment that was not stolen. I did confirm the Osmond grant was placed in the wrong account and was spent. I could not reinstate the lost pension, I mean lost police vest grant. Um, I identified two CNA railroad accounts and closed one of them. I'm working to eliminate some of the 30 plus bank accounts. I did recently find financing for the public works department to get new equipment in the uh, FY21 budget. I provided trust to with full, she, let me not say I, because I did not. Trustee Brewer was provided full access to the financial system with uh, printable capacities, capabilities. The 2018 W-2s were corrected. I did notify the particular employees that was impacted by that, that if they had an issue with their tax repair, please let us know, and we would um, 
pay them for that um, additional fees to their accountant. And as of today, no one has came to our office to say they have to pay additional fees for incorrect 2018 W-2s. I tried to renegotiate re with another garbage company, a 14-year garbage contract that the village currently have. That's increased annually at 3%. Um, I worked with the fire chief to analyze his ambulance to analyze his ambulance contract. As you guys know, we have a new ambulance service in town, and from my understanding and what I hear, that ambulance service is doing a marvelous job, especially when it comes to call times. Uh, I finished up the 2014 DC, um, DCO grant information, so that's back on track. So uh, finally, for the future, these are some of the things that I'm trying to work on and get resolved. We just recently had a call with Miller Cooper, the village auditors. So we're working on trying to address some of the repeat issues that has been redundant in the last few audits. Myself and the HR personnel is working to um, get a new payroll system that's gonna be more efficient for everybody, including the department heads, when it comes to time for them to submit their payroll. We also looking into a uh, fines collection system, the system we have, it's been around for 20 years and it's outdated. The issue behind that is if you write a ticket today, but it doesn't go to the collection agency for another month, two months, the likelihood of you collecting any money, even at a percentage, is very slim. So that's one of the things that we have been relaxed. We have not um, went out to people that owe us fines and tickets. So we're trying to get a new system for that. One of my recommendations, as I said last year, is to hold quality meetings with the department heads so that at the end of the fiscal year, no department head can come and say they did not know where they was, where they was editing their budget. So if they went over budget, it should already be identified prior to the end of um, 4.30 of our fiscal year. Um, we do need to continue work on a bank reconciliation. If you guys recall, I said there's over almost 400 bank reconciliation that has to be done on an annual basis. And I'll say it again, that is a lot for one person to do 400 plus bank reconciliation, which is why I'm pushing to close some of these bank accounts. Um, I, one of the things that's supposed to be happening is reviewing of all contractors, consultant contracts. Again, like I said, some of the vendors we have or head um, we was double billing just because they're two different vendors or two different companies, but we're paying for the same services. So I think all uh, contractor contracts need to be reviewed and analyzed and making sure we're getting best services for the price we're paying. Um, I think I have a great teamwork working relationship with the, with the administration staff. Um, I will can I can say that the young ladies that I work with, I feel like they are my sisters that I can call and ask them to do pretty much anything that I need done without a, a gripe complaint, even if it's 5, 5.30 and they're about to go home, they will stop and assist me if I'm trying to gather some information, even um, to the point where they would come in and help me out on the weekends. Um, one of the things that I mentioned before to the body is our union contract, in my opinion, is not in the favor of the village, not even close. I think that is something that has to be looked at have to, and have to have the attorney aggressively go after and look at this union contract and make sure that all the benefit is not one-sided. Currently, if you look at the union contract, all the gravy goes to the union employees. And if I'm a union employee, I will love it too. And finally, I think we need to start looking at vendors and reduce certain vendors. Most of the vendors that we have in South Village has been here 20 plus years. Most of the vendors that I think that we have here can and should provide better services for the amount of money we're paying them. But until that get analyzed and get um, looked at objectively, the village is gonna end up paying more and more money that's unnecessarily. So, so I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. So I'll oh, boom with that. So with that, I'll um, take any questions that you guys might have, but I just want to at least give you a pretty much a quick snapshot of what's going on in the village. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, uh, sir. Um, I'm going to start with the obvious. Of what would appear to be the obvious. Can you, can you move your mask for a second so I can, I can hear you? Sure. Okay. I'm going to start with what I would consider to be the obvious questions to, to ask. 
Why, in your opinion, has it taken the trustees so long to pass the 2020 budget when the fiscal year began in, in May, was it? Yes. Okay. Why do you think it's taken the trustees so long? Well, there, there's two parts, and I don't want to put it all on the trustees. One is, Salt Village has a tendency to just talk and argue. We have things that are going on with, with respect to running the village that's delaying a lot of stuff that does not have anything to do with finances. Um, when I had the original budget plan, it was during the week. Historically, my understanding and what I've been told, the village does their audit, I mean, their fiscal appropriation on weekends. Well, when we started that, that was on Saturday in July. One of the issues were, like I said, was the job description. That came a little later. But we met with all the department heads on a particular Saturday and got their input on their um, allocation of what they wanted to spend. Once that took place, it was an issue. And somewhat still currently is job description review. I don't think, again, like I said earlier, that's have anything to do with me knowing finances of revenue, revenue or expenses. I just need to know how much we're gonna pay a person for their, thank you, how much, how much we're gonna pay a person for a particular position, the notion of what they should or should not do that should be done on the administrative side, not on finance. So I think that's the biggest thing. We have too many involvement with day-to-day -day operation as opposed to just finances. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is, uh, what's being done about the audits and the findings of the different audits? What are you doing about that? Right, right now, we're not doing anything. Um, as you all know, I was only here part-time two days a week. The finance department, I think, is one of the most underappreciated departments in any organization, definitely in a municipality. There's so many nuances of government accounting that you need more than just one person. Um, even the time that I try to allocate to finance, it's a lot. Um, whether I'm taking time away to chase down a grant, chase down bank accounts, provide um, for your information, that takes away from uh, doing the audit findings. Most of the audit findings, as you guys will find out in the next couple of weeks, probably the next couple of months, it relates to policies and procedures. If you don't have the manpower to implement policy and procedures, it's hard to get them done. So I think the overall objective is to, should be to make sure you have strong individuals in the finance team, and then just like any other department, have them do what they need to get done and work on it. But it's not something that's going to be done overnight. Um, the audit findings go back at least five, six years, so it's a process. Linda Washington, how are you? I'm good. Just a quick statement and a quick question. Did I hear you say that the budget being passed is being held up because of a job description not being put out, but the job descriptions out that's holding up the budget being passed? Yes. That's ridiculous. And I just want to say that I appreciate whosoever idea this was tonight, if it was yours. This is the most transparency that I have seen in years. And just the fact that you're here with all of this documentation, answering all of these questions and addressing all of these different bullet points, it is a lot of information to absorb in one night, but I'm glad that you're doing this. And I just want to say as a resident, this is the most transparent. If you guys recall, when I used to sit over there, I, I said that um, I have no problem providing information. Um, and I, I'm not gonna waver from that. I've always been able to provide information regardless of what it is. As I mentioned earlier, I pushed for the friends of God. One, be honest with you, whatever happened in 2017 has nothing to do with me. When you don't have nothing to hide or you feel like you can do your job, why not? I have no problem, like I said before, 
um, have the residents, I think Ms. Washington, you and I spoke briefly last year, talking to individuals, asking, answering questions, because at the end of the day, like I said, and I told a member um, in the administration just recently, I work for the residents, and I, I mean that. You can go check on me from Markham, Linwood, Phoenix, and Robbins. From the mayor to the trustees, they have no issues with me because I have nothing to hide. We might disagree. Let me not act like we don't. But as far as information and transparency, you get it all the time. I just think, unfortunately, there's a lot of cloud of mess that hasn't been able to allow stuff like this to come out. And I did decide to have this this evening for that reason, because I'm slowly weaning my way away from Salt Village. When I do leave Salt Village, what will not happen, as I mentioned last year, my name will never be tarnished, because I know what I've done. I know that since I've been here, Salt Village have at least, at the very least, got an additional $200,000. And let me say that before I finish. I know people have been issuing about my check, my pay, and all that stuff. Just the tax anticipating warranty alone has paid my salary. This program was in place way before I got here. Again, that's documented. So when people say, oh, he's making all this money, I pay for my salary. How you doing, sir? I'm good, thank you. Uh, I was looking in, uh, in your notes that you passed out. Thank you. Thank you, man. I'd really hear you. Thank you. Uh, it says that we have over 67 fire hydrants or maybe even more that are inoperable and we have the money to fix them. I'm trying to figure out what's the process and why hasn't that been done because that puts residents at risk and in harm's way. Um, yes, um, I, I did say there's about 67 fire hydrants broken. It's about the same amount that was broken last year when I was asked to find, looked into it. Why it's not getting done, I, I can't tell you why. I do know that I've heard it's because of the department's understaffed. I recommend it to the department to outsource it. I've been told if we outsource it, they're gonna file a grievance. If you guys recall last year, there was a big incident with me and the public works director allegedly got into a fisticuff, and that was not true. What happened was, in my office, and I said it again, I said it last year, the gentleman, I told to collect water. I'm a military person, and when I'm told to do something, I'm gonna try my best to do it. So the solution was to have his department go out and turn off water, or we outsource it, same way I did in Markham. He didn't like that answer. He felt the water fund was his water fund. He stood up, proceeded to put his hand in my face. Since that time, me and this gentleman do not have a, relate, a working relationship. As far as the fire hydrant, the engineer said it cost $10,000 to do a fire hydrant. I know that is not true. This cost $2,500 to buy a brand new fire hydrant. All 67 fire hydrants in Salt Village do not need to be fully replaced. So you have an issue that the union don't want you to outsource because they want to file a grievance, which costs more attorney fees and more fees to them. You have an issue because a member of the body make excuses that they understaff. That should be unacceptable because based on my research, these fire hydrants did happen last year or the year before. They've been going on for at least the last administration. So it's a matter of will. If the, in, if the same amount of energy is put into the finance department, I mean put in public works as it is put in the finance department, then it would be resolved. If you guys check the videos and the minutes, the one thing that is talked about every single meeting, including committee meeting, is finance. You guys will think, which is why I wanted this meeting tonight, that the finance is burning up in Salt Village. I can go around Salt Village and show you a lot more that's burning up. Well, I got so many questions, I'm gonna stay with the uh, budget. You can ask, I'm, I'm here, I have Okay, all right. Has there been a budget proposed by the trustees since they won't pass the one that's before them? And if so, is this budget that's proposed by the trustees balanced? And if not, where do the trustees plan to get the money? Okay, to answer your question, um, in the back and forth of the department head of the trustees, 
We took our recommendation that is in the budget now. The budget that I provided maybe a week ago, it is balanced. As far as where the money is coming from, most of it is coming from just normal operation. I think in this budget is $400,000 that's being transferred from the water to cover general operation expenses, but the budget is balanced. I'm just waiting to get to go ahead um, to say put it out there for the residents to have a 10-day review. Thank you. Yeah. Who, who are you waiting? I mean, on. I'm waiting on trustees to give me a consensus that it's done. I'm done with my part. My numbers are done. How long have you been done? At the very least, at the last week. Everything is done. Wow. I didn't know we could ask something more than once. So I just want to ask real quickly because I got here late. I apologize for coming from another meeting. But did you talk anything about the attorney fees and how many attorneys we have and how much has been spent for attorneys as far as the budget is concerned? In, in the budget right now for the attorney fees, if I recall, I think we have 250000 260000 allocated to the attorneys. That is allocated for one attorney firm. What? How many attorneys do we have? One attorney firm. We average about eighteen to 20000 per month. Time that by 12, that's two forty. That's quite a bit of money. Uh, for it's one of those vendors that I say you guys as trustees, I mean uh, residents, to really analyze and ask questions. Okay, I would like to actually go back and talk about the, uh, the uh, audit and uh, forensic audit. Now, now, we have to do regular audits. Why is it necessary at this time to do a forensic audit? Doesn't that cost us more taxpayer dollars as well? Yes. Um, again, if you recall, when I mentioned about not doing a forensic audit, it can cost up to $100,000. Now, because we have a forensic audit, what's not going to happen, you're, gonna, you're not going to get your regular audit done until the forensic audit is done. Because the normal auditor is not going to finish until the forensic audit is done. So however long it takes the forensic audit to go through their process, that, that's going to hold up the regular audit. Now, here's the other thing. The auditors do not just work for Salt Village. They, they like property management firms. So they have a time. So if they say we're done with Salt Village audit in October, November, and we can't start again until March, then that's just more delayed because if they got to wait on the forensic audit, it just pushes everything back. So over the next few months, you're going to hear that the audit is not done. When you hear that, just ask, is the forensic audit done? Because if the forensic audit is not done, the 2019 audit is not done. 2020 audit would just should start now for this fiscal year that just ended. Probably would not be done no sooner than October 2021. Well, with that, with regard to what you just said, I would like to know, since it is my money mm -hmm. that they're spending, it's our money that they're spending, who determined that we needed a forensic audit? Because a forensic audit uh, more or less suggests that there's some discrepancy or something hidden or something done wrong. And that's, that's what I get. I, I don't know if I'm right or wrong about that, no. but usually people think that somebody took some money inappropriately. So who determined that, and then who determined that we needed to spend this money on a forensic audit, and in your opinion, was that necessary? Okay, the last part of it, it was, I don't think it was necessary. Um, ultimately, I did recommend that we do the forensic audit, because, again, if you go back, we went around and around and around about having a forensic audit. Residents, trustees, but not wanted a forensic audit. I'm the type of person, again, if you have nothing to hide, put it out there. I don't think we should waste the money, but if it costs us to even things out and have a working relationship, then so be it. Yes, it's cost unnecessary money, but I'd rather be able to work together as a team and move the village forward. The trustees, um, I guess more likely, more than not, the mayor didn't want one, voted to approve the forensic audit. We went through a process of three forensic audit firms, 
I asked each trustees which one they recommend, da 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 da. So we voted on the one Sickage. Sickage is a very well known, well respected government accounting firm that's named nationwide. So that's how the process came. The reason, as you said, the, the essence of a forensic audit is to believe that there's some kind of fraud or misappropriation going on. Again, back to the $250,000 the lack of transparency that I was saying from the finance department. The, no, the notion was that in 2017, there was improprieties going on in the finance department. Now, again, I recommended the firms to, to go, I mean, to move forward from this audit, but as I've told the board many times, let's say, let's just say, the mayor did something wrong and gave the directive to the finance director at that time. There's a thing, thing called plausible deniability. If he does not have an email, a signature, or anything like that, and that finance director chose to make an illegal transaction, how's that gonna stand up in anybody court that he was fearful of the mayor? And that's why he did it. Because he had years of experience. So, that was the notion. So when I try to push back on the forensic audit, I was telling them it does not make sense. Because even if the mayor told me to do something, if I'm not getting anything in writing, I'm not doing it. When people, when I leave here, and you guys ask for transfers and this and all that, you will find paper trail, you will find my signature, and you will find emails. Because I want to show why and where I did what I did. And that's why I don't think we need a forensic audit. Because it goes back to the person that was here that, for whatever reason, believe he didn't ever, that person never made mistakes. Last question. Did I hear you say that in the water fund, you didn't have to touch the water fund for almost a whole year, other than $400,000? With the past year, I started in mid-February. I just touched the waterfront, I think maybe in June. And the only reason I touched it because of the money we lost from the COVID. And so you're able to make the payroll, which is bi-weekly, without touching the waterfront? I'm able to make all bills bi-weekly. If you go back to the minutes, there's a time, I think maybe in May, that I told the board that we probably have some vendors that we pay 60 days past due. That's because I'm monitoring the money. If you guys heard one thing from me, and anybody in here can do it, the revenue from the state, it is what it is. You can go look on the revenue for the sales tax that I got in here in my folder from last year, time to about 3%, that's probably what you get this year. So if I look at June last year, let's say it's $100,000, and I know we got COVID, the likelihood we're going to get $100,000 is slim to none. So I might make my adjustment based on getting 90000 in doing that, that means I can't pay the same amount of bills I paid in May because I'm getting less money in June, and that's why I had to use the money. But I had already prepared a documentation for the body to give them a 90-day a review of what I anticipated was going to be lost revenue. And if they recall, I said lost revenue is going to be about 500000 We lost about 400000 so I went too far off. Well, I want to commend you because if you can make payroll every two weeks without touching that water fund, that's commendable. But I also heard you say something about paying two people, I think two consultants at the same time. And you talked about you feel that the union contract is in favor of the employees and not Salt Village, the employer. But the former HR person that we had that supposedly been negotiating that union contract for six months, making almost $6,000 every two weeks, did a piss poor job. And thank you for this meeting again. It's been very transparent tonight. Thank you. Let me um, address what I was referring to in the union contract. One of the things that we probably about to give very more money on is a grievance again, and I'm not picking on them. I just believe fair is fair, right is right. Is the um, current public work contract. I was tasked to analyze the health insurance back in March. I did. Came over a plan to raise the deductible. The reason I did that, we did a three year analysis. Less than, I think, I might have it wrong now, 15 or 20%, let's just say 20% on the high end of the employees maxed out the deductible over three-year average. So we raised the deductible to $250,000. Of the $250,000, the employee 
employees will be on the hook for $500. They currently was on the hook for $250. So they added additional $250 to their health insurance. The village will be on the hook for the remaining $2,000. But in their weekly paycheck, they went, they saw a decrease anywhere from $6 per two weeks to $30 per two weeks. And currently, the old way, they was paying for prescription drugs, generic prescription drugs. With this new proposal, they're not. So not only do they save money weekly, I mean every two weeks, they also save money on prescription drugs. Unfortunately, the public work employees balk, balked at it. Now this process started back in February under the old VA because he asked me to look into it. They pushed back at it to the tune where now we have it in place. They probably filed a grievance and whatever happened with the attorneys that we have that we paid $240,000, there's gonna be additional fees for them to represent us in court. I don't think that's right that eight members, seven members of a department in this village hold hostage the other 34 employees. I made my case very strongly to the attorney to the board about a month ago. Now, they're gonna say, oh, we paying more money. Again, nothing I say, I, do, I cannot back up. I have the spreadsheet. I had a meeting with them, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. And you know how many of those eight people showed up at those meetings? One time was there more than two people. The first two meetings, one person showed up. The third, the third meeting, two people showed up. The fourth meeting and the final meeting was with, with, was with the um, um, insurance broker. That's when they showed up and all hell broke loose. The young lady called me devastated. She was like, felt like I set her up for that meeting. I didn't organize that meeting. The VA, current VA organized that meeting. And because he was not involved with the process, could not articulate what the contract, with, I mean the new health insurance was really exp um, detailing to the employees. So that's gonna be something that's happening in the, fu in the future. Now, one of the things with, doc with the HR consulting with her bills, was they typically on the high end? More likely. What she, as if y'all remember, I said before, it is not my job to tell somebody what they worth. Hell, I feel like I'm worth $100 an hour. If somebody's willing to pay me, I'm gonna go get it, just like you guys feel y'all worth so much per hour. But the problem comes back in because you have three union contracts that they all different. They, they, they have different years that they in, they have different perks. There's contracts that after three years, they got like five weeks vacation. Where, where's that happening? You know, so there's a lot of stuff that I think that she tried to do with pushback and because there's no unity and working together, it was all she just to me. Just like when, when I was trying to make changes. Oh, Mr. Finch making just Mr. Finch making changes. Well, if you step back and be open and honest, the problem was already there. You just asking a professional to come in, assess the situation based on their experience and make recommendations. The question is, do the village want to make changes? Because up to this point, collectively, the village do not want to make changes. And I'll say this before I answer another question. I grew up in Memphis. My uncle had a farm. And as a kid, I never understood why he always told us, don't wash pigs. So we go wash the pigs and they go right back in the mud. Unfortunately, if we don't change this cycle, Salt Village, in my opinion, is going to stay in the financial mud that it has been in for years. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Okay, Mr. Finch, from what I heard, you've done a stand up job. Okay. You're beyond reproach. I'm going back to this audit. There's no need, therefore, based on your performance, that this that there should be an audit for this current Well, it, it, it can't stop now. It's the, the, the will is in motion. Okay. Well, then, all right. But you brought up uh, 2017, the uh, time before you. Could, can you say in your own words, you know, based on what you've seen, you know, according to the records, what happened back then? Well, let me start with the biggest issue. One of the biggest issues was the $250,000 that um, the mayor moved from the TIF account to pay a bond payment. That came out as the mayor stole money. So that's the start of the whole, pretty much the conversation, the basis of it. 
What happened, the money was moved out of the TIF. Normally, you do not take money out of TIF because it's restricted. Within two weeks, the money was replaced back into the TIF because every December, we get money from Amalgamated Bank. It's called, it's due with the administration. So about roughly mid-December, you get $250,000. Again, that's something that's been going on for years. So that money came back to the village. The village put it back in the TIF. The bigger problem was, and this is why, normally I don't do it, but this is why I could pat myself on the back with what you said, Ms. Washington, is manage cash flow. Every year, bond payments are either due June or December. So the question is, no one would tell me the answer. Why was that money not put aside for a bond payment that has happened during this person's time over the last eight years? Because if they were here eight years, they should know. There's a, in the budget that you guys can get to see, when you go to the last page, it shows all the debt. In the Excel file, it shows you when payments are due. So that's the question that should have been asked before we got into a forensic audit. Why wasn't money put aside for a bond payment that comes every year around the same time? It's like Christmas, it's gonna be there. So the other thing that I noticed, um, like I said, with the IRS, that was a payment because we did not properly fill out the health insurance. When President Obama did uh, Obamacare, you have to fill out certain paperwork and submit it. That was not properly done. The village got a fine of 30 some thousand dollars. Why wasn't it done? I do not know. The other fine that we got, and this was not in 2017, I want to say 2018, was an IMRF fine because we paid an individual retirement funds based on sick days. Sick days are not to be paid out and given IMRF. But like I said, when I tried to rectify it, it was past the grace period. So looking at 2017 with the Oslin grant, the transfer of $250,000, the um, insurance piece not done correctly, that was, that's just the biggest thing that was the issue. It was more policy and procedures and having people really, really understanding government accounting. That's why when you guys hear people tell me don't take it personal, I do take it personal because we have the young ladies right now that was thrown into a position to learn their job when every person that was there, and I'm gonna say it, via the mayor terminating them, via them putting in their resignation, but within, but within a matter of months, everybody in there was brand new, learning a new system, learning a new job, learning the toxic environment of, of government, but yet, to this day, those same individuals are getting tapped. So when you hear trustees say, for me not to take it personally, how can I not? Because since day one, the administration of this department from the front window to the back office has getting attacked. There's a young lady right now that I've taken out to lunch a couple of times because she is so stressed out because, and I'm gonna say it, because right now this is a meeting, this is my meeting because the village administrator constantly bombard her with unnecessary questions that he provided by the trustees. If anything, I wish that people understand how to run a finance department. Because if, because if you don't know how to run a finance department, you just get in the way. And I say this to them, and I've told them via emails numerous times. <clears throat> it's amazing how all the problems in the village is on the shoulders of the new staff. But again, and I've said this so many times on records, not one to answer your question, trustee could tell you about the audit findings and why it was not corrected in 15, 16, 17, or 18 with those quote unquote experienced staff. But yet, to this day, we have a million dollars in the water account. So I applaud those ladies, because I know what they do every day i know what their intentions are but we have an issue speaking of that and let me let the residents know last year i told you the budget was held up for two people some of the trustees disagreed with me those two people was public, was public works director and the mayor assistant it's centered around money my whole take on it i don't care if you don't like somebody 
If they get the job done, they get the job done. I can sit right here next to a KKK person, as long as we get the job done. As long as you don't say certain words to me, I won't have a reaction, but we can get the job done. One of the things that we're discussing right now is whether or not we're gonna pay everybody a 2.5% raise, but the ladies, full-time ladies in administration. I've told the board, I don't think that's right. Now, before any board member say I'm lying, I have emails, because again, I don't say nothing that I cannot prove, because I do know social media is a, be a beast, but we have those issues. Those are the issues that's holding up the budget, because we are worrying about the wrong things. We're worrying about, well, this is the mayor friend. This is a perfect example. The new ethnic community development person. I know, everybody assume I know him, I don't. I, don't, I never worked with him, I never grew up with him, none of that. But because I guess we both black men, we have to work together. Those, those are the things that's holding up the budget. Unnecessary stuff that has nothing to do with finance. As far as 2% raise, if it's good for half the village, it should be good for all the village. like there's some underlying motives with regard to how things are being done and they're going outside the proper protocol with regard to procedure. I know in my opinion that when this uh, when this new trustee board took control that they had a uh, ax to grind. That's just my opinion. And I see it with uh, the way they get things done. There's always been preference in, in politics. You know, friends get favors. Even the trustees who accuse the mayor of having friends in place have family on staff. So it's not uncommon. But with that being said, it, it should not interfere with the, with the process getting done and the taxpayers receiving the adequate services and protections of their monies that they, that they surely need. Nobody's here. Uh, millionaires, we all here, and we struggle to pay our bills. And that should be considered by the very people who sit up at that, at that podium up there because they have to pay bills as well. We have a, we have a, you say, regional garbage disposal contract of over 14 years with a 3% that accrues annually. Now, it might not make sense to some people, but to me, this is going to spiral out of control at some point within these 14 years. Just say, for instance, if our bills that we're taking in is averaging out to about $60,000, and then we owe them $65,000 in the next year, we owe them a 3% on that, but we still want to get in the 60. So over a matter of five or six years, that increase has double folded over we actually have to pay. Where does that money come from? Well, <laughs> that money gonna come from you guys. Because, again, like I said to uh, earlier, the state don't give you so much money. The state, the county, you can go back and look at last year, increase it by three, four, five percent. Then you gotta also consider that union contracts gonna increase about two, three percent. So when the water goes up, I mean the garbage goes up three percent, either the village gonna eat it or the village gonna charge you guys. Now if they eat it, guess where the money gonna come from? The water fund. And we'll be right back where we was last summer that you're taking money out of the water fund to pay for operational expense. So over time, your bill is gonna go up. And it's not gonna be something that the whoever a year from now the current mayor is, or two years from now the current mayor is, it's something that was done roughly, I think about eight years ago now, six years ago, I think. So that, that's the thing when I say, let the finance department do their job and analyze stuff. Like, back to the, the ambulance. When we discussed this, I think late fall last year, myself and Chief Barrett, we looked at the numbers, like what's gonna be the major impact on costs? 
And when it came to that, it made sense that they was cheaper and provided on paper, because everything's on paper. Everybody is like dating. The first couple of days, you're the best in the world. But on paper, it looks like they will provide better service, but definitely a cheaper cost. That's an analysis that has to be done on all vendors. That's not always done, and that has not been done. So again, when you allow finance professionals to analyze, come and make recommendations, and listen to it, it makes the overall the village better. To your point about um, people do have family members and all that stuff, I've been working since I was 15 years old. I've people that I've worked with that are great at what they do, I will call them to work with me somewhere else. That's not uncommon. That's how you build an organization. You go get people that have the skill set to do it and get the job done that you want done. Now, the flip side of that, if you feel those people are not competent, once they get in the job, there's a process that you go through to terminate them. But you don't harass them. You don't intimidate them. You don't use your title to make it seem like they are beneath you. Unfortunately, like I said, the young lady here, people, I'm, I'm going to back. Last year, when I got here, it was said that the environment was toxic. I can tell you, in the last two months, it's way more toxic than ever been. I had something happen to me last week that has never happened since I worked at 15 years old in Great America. For the first time, I was told I was getting written up, and apparently he did it, by the village administrator. Now, when I talked to him, because I, I believe, like I said before, I'm a man, I talk to you man to man, eye to eye. You cannot, as a village administrator, write up the treasurer no sooner than you can write up the clerk or the mayor. But he has the audacity to think he could write me up because he was told to have me put something in writing for the trustees. Now, the information he asked about, which but to pertain to the pay of the two individuals, that pay was reduced in the FY20 budget. I provided him those numbers two weeks prior. As I told him, and I tell you guys, he could write the numbers on a piece of paper and send them to the trustee if he, if he chooses. I'm not giving to them in paper because, again, it would be a political, it would be a Facebook ploy, and I'm not playing nobody game when it comes to politics. If we're not going to do the job right, don't let me be part of your mess. Can you hear me, Mr. Finch? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what I wanted to know is, I know that you said uh, so this is a tax about the tax money tonight, basically. you said, and I am just applauding the fact that payroll is being able to be paid without tapping into the water fund. So now, just for verification, taxes are due again when? Property taxes? Yes. They're for, to come to the village or to, for the residents to pay? For the residents to pay, I think they moved it to December. Okay. So when that tax money come in, would that be a surplus to our budget because we're able to make payroll right now without going into the water fund? So when the taxes are paid coming up, would that be a surplus to our budget or is that money already targeted to pay for something that we have like aging reports or whatever? It, it's, it's, it's somewhat targeted because through, toward the end of the, fiscal, the end of the calendar year, less other state revenue comes in. So, like at the beginning of the year, beginning of the year, you, the state sends us majority of income tax because that's when everybody files their income tax. The latter part of the year, we get less income tax. So basically, the state revenue goes up and then slowly come down. 
as it goes down, we get more money from the county. So in the six, every six months that you pay your first installment, your second installment, as that money trickles in, it balances out what we get from the state. So all, all in all, it's, it's not a straight line, it's just up and down. It goes back to monitoring your cash, like you just said. So me knowing that October, November, December is typically a slow month. That means I need to now have money put aside because I know in December, even though it's October, I got a big bond payment due. I can't bank that I'll get all my property taxes. I can't bank on how much that property tax is going to be because you don't know. One of the things that Salt Lake has been doing over the last few years, which is why um, we're trying to get these uh, vacant houses done is if you look at the audit, your property tax collection is declining. Last year, I think Salt Village collected 73% of the property taxes that were available. And as that number decreased, that's money you don't, you don't have. It's no different than you, you all of a sudden your boss come in one day and say, I'm gonna take a dollar from your paycheck. That's not the same money you're gonna get in two weeks. So it's the same kind of principle. Just want to commend you. Just by listening to your conference or your little meeting tonight, you've shown this village a lot of things. And once they lose you, they lose a good thing. I'm very, very angry being a resident here in Salt Village, hearing the things that I've heard. You know about water, fire hydrants, and different minor little things that it doesn't take much money for the village to get it done. So the problem really is not you nor is it our mayor, it's our trustees. We need to get someone in here that say that we can trust to take care of Salt Village. We live here, this is our home. A lot of us are retirees, I'm a retiree, that came here to this village because I like what I saw. But for the last past five years that I've been here, I hate this place almost because they're not taking care of their business. Well, thank you. Um, and I know it's been tried to get me out of here probably two months ago. I'm not leaving no sooner than April 30th, 2021, even as a trustee. I am transitioned as the interim finance director. But because I have a relationship with the staff, I will be around to assist them and give them whatever help I can. It's interesting what you said about as the, uh, a residence. There are several emails that I've provided to the trustees, um, and I stated that, that I feel sorry for you guys. I feel sorry for you guys because it is a lot of fighting. To what you said, um, Mr. Larry, about hiring people, and I know people are gonna take it differently. It's amazing, like I said, be fair. The village administrator we have this time, the village administrator we have last time, those were recommendations by the trustees. But when the mayor make a recommendation, it's time to go to court. It's, and I say that because just last, two Saturdays ago, I put in a budget for the mayor to go to court to fight for his community development person whose salary was reduced $20,000 last year from what the previous person was making. Not because that person did or did not have the skills to do that job, but just because they felt that was the right thing to do. But again, the two VAs that we have here, they was recommended, not by the mayor, by the trustees. The last one here, he's recommended by the same attorney firm we have in house. But yet, no one bark at that. Now, I know I've been attacked about my credibility and all this other stuff, but like I asked him the other day, and you guys can should ask him too. How many years of full-time experience do you have running a village? I can tell you that. That answer is no. no. I mean none. But yet, he has the audacity to want to write me up because I didn't do what the trustees told him to tell me to do. I told you guys last year, and I'll tell you guys this year, and I tell the like I told the trustees at America a few weeks ago, I'm not beholden to nobody in this room. I joked with the mayor last night and I said, there's only two women I answer to, and that's my wife and my baby girl. So I don't answer to the mayor and jump when he say bark. I don't bark and jump when the trustees say bark. So yes, I feel sorry for you residents because it's so much infighting. It's not, and I even asked the trustees this. I said, find a project, work on a project 
And when you run for office, let that stand for what you did. Because this year, I challenge any department other than this one, and the fire department, and the police department. And, and, and the police department, y'all be with him. He's doing some wonderful things. He got a lot of wonderful things coming. But what has been done, improved in the last year? In my eyes, nothing. Financially, we've done a great job and there's a lot more to do. So I, I, I understand your frustration, but until the board decides to work with the mayor, not against the mayor, not run the court, you ask why the attorney bills $240,000? Four years one day, and look who they talk to. I know last bill I got the other day, they spent eight hours in one day. I said, darn, that means they work a lot, because if you spend eight hours talking to one body, of this village, what do you do with your other clients? Because I'm sure we cannot be, we are not their only client. So it's, and I told the trustees this, and they got mad at me. I think most of them are hypocritical. They say one thing to you guys in public, do another thing in executive session, and make decisions that benefits them. But again, the VA was recommended. Now, I said something earlier in my notes about the consultant. The finance record position has been posted for years. You pull it up, it was posted as an employee. The day of committee meeting, out the blue, we had two people interviewed for consultants. Now, that's not nothing bad. The problem I have with that is, if the mayor did that, all hell would broke loose at committee yeah. meeting. So, why is it good for them and not good for the mayor? Right. Not only did that happen, the cheaper one, for 20 hours a week, you spoke, you spoke about the HR consultant. The cheaper person was going to charge $80,000 for 20 hours a week. That's not my words, that's, those are what the words he said. And not only that, coming all the way from my task. So you tell me, that don't look kind of fishy. I know people might love Salt Village, but coming that far, that just seemed impossible. You can't find nobody else local or closer than two hours away. The other gentleman, Unbeknownst to me, you would think that you would provide, when you're interviewing for a finance director, that the finance person who has been here for over a year would have some kind of input. Again, the village administrator made that decision. But, but if you look at his background, like they did my background last year, he has no finance experience. He had a person come in that wouldn't even tell who referred him. He was charging one twenty, dollars $120,000 for 20 hours a week. But yet the uproar was for Dr. Strader getting paid $6,000 a month. Six times 12 is 72. 72 is less than 80,000 and definitely less than 120,000. That's why the board now is mad at me because I'm challenging them on being hypocritical. I know, but again, I'm gonna tell you like I told them, prove me wrong and tell me where I lie, but show me. Is that it? But I'm Francine Anderson, and I just wanted to get up and also uh, piggyback on Ms. Washington and the lady here and, com and compliment you on the tonight and being open and transparent because um, being over a 30-some year resident myself, I see some transparency that I haven't seen in a long time as well. Um, and for um, the citizenry, we need to educate them as well about the toxicity of what's going on in our village hall. Um, most uh, people that are not in this room does not take time to educate themselves, but it's behoove us to educate them on what's going on because it's time that we stop losing very qualified personnel because of relationships that certain people have with each other. And then the other thing for me is that we understand that two of our trustees are former employees, so we know that they are voting and their concerns are one-sided. Um, we as the citizenry has to make some difference. And I will say to you um, that I think today was well deserving and I appreciate you and your sharing. And um, I'm like the others, I hope that you do not plan on leaving Salt Village anytime soon, but I see you referenced it. But um, stay still and know that the citizens are looking. I'll be here as a trustee capacity. But, but I will ask the, the residents, come out. And again, I'll say the same thing I've said last year. 
Come out and ask questions. Look at the invoices and ask. Ask the questions that were asked last year, but those questions were asked, if you recall, only pertaining to people that were believed to be the mayor's bobbleheads. I'm not saying, like I said to the trustees and the, and the mayor before, I don't care what your political affiliation is, I don't care if the mayor win next year, I don't care if he lose next year. It's not about that for me. It's about coming in here, doing a job. And if the job cannot be done because you're interfering, because you have the control of the board, that's not right. Because I said again, the trustees are losing out. There's fire hydrants is broken. I've heard residents complain. There used to be a young lady that sit right there all the time. She had full grown weeds in the back of her house. Myself and the I can say her name now, Tanya worked to getting that cut down, not in her house, the house next door to her, she kept complaining about it. Why it was never done by our staff, I don't know. But those are the things that could be addressed, it should be addressed, it should be answered. Because a year from last year to now, go back and just ask you yourselves, what has improved? Other than this finance, because again, we got a million dollars in the water count, and I applaud myself, AP, Finance, assistant finance director, the IT person, and even I give the public works director some credit because he had to get the guys out there and get, and get the water turned off after we had our little Ronnie in. Mr. Finch, I commend you for your patience in dealing with these idiots. Because it's stupid for people to get elected by us and then think they got power over us. They don't have that power. Racism has no place in politics. I don't see black and white. Whenever one group prospers, the next group is supposed to prosper right along with it. If the mayor does something that benefits the black community, the white community is going to benefit as well. The rules aren't written to say that like it used to be in the old days, you can't use this washroom because of your color. It's not like that anymore. Everything is written up to the equal opportunity of all residents, or it's supposed to be. But I've seen in this very room where you take money from one person, that person just happened to be black. Like you said, cut her salary $20,000 and then give this man a raise. He just happened to be black. Maybe he just happened to be, or maybe it stinks of racism. These people are hell bent on putting things back the way they were, and I'm hell bent on not letting them. And we need to come together. And we need to have some of our own people. This thing is turning into a black and white issue. And I don't have a problem with it. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that it's anything other than that because I've seen the behavior of some of these trustees. The only reason I can't verify it absolutely is because they have black puppets that do their bidding. And that's, that's insidious to me. Why would you do that? Why would you do that when you see the needs of the people? Why would you be so selfish as to try to escalate the wealth of people you favor and decrease the wealth of ones you don't, even though the ones you don't may be even more qualified than the people you want to give it to? Our money is being outsourced. None of the money is being spent where it should be on our roads, on our lights, on our fire hydrant. We got a lawyer getting all this money, twenty and thirty thousand dollars a month, and probably for some hours spent doing something that should have been done for free. With regard to FOIAs, why is he doing that? Why is he being allowed? Why is he getting so many phone calls when they know what he charged per hour? With questions that they could ask each other, with questions that they already have the answers to. This theft, this theft by deception. It's, um, we need to change that. It's interesting that you said that last part with respect to FOIAs. We do have a volunteer person that does FOIAs free. Um, it was questioned by me if we secretly paid a person. The answer is no. Um, now they're verifying that by wanting to look at the payroll every two weeks, which is fine. Because again, if you have nothing to hide, show it. But, that was one of my questions. Why would you pay somebody $165 an hour to get the information, come to us, to ask for the information, we send it back to them to provide the information? That's not how it's normally done. In 
looking at the bills that I do, the way I do it, as you, as you guys recall, I said I run it like my household. I can tell you my wife spent something she wasn't supposed to spend because I already know they ain't how it's supposed to go. I found that the, a bill, again, this is one of those paying bills twice. Because our current attorney works on everything in the village, there's a worker comp bill that came through. I caught that we paid them $14,000 on a worker's comp bill and $14,000 on their regular bills. Again, I'm not tooting my horn, but had I not been here, that would have been a waste of $14,000. Those are the kind of things when I hear the trustees say, follow the money, being transparent, you only follow the money for one department, and that's the administration. Those ladies in there are the lowest paid people in this village, but I have to fight to give them a two and a half percent raise. But like I told the trustees and I asked Mary Williams last year, or two years ago, are your union employees, and this is something you residents can ask, answer, are your union employees better than your non-union employees? And if the answer is no, then why do you treat them different? That's all I'm talking about. Treat them the same, hold them accountable. Because unlike the union employees, you can easily, and it has been done, fire the non-union employees. But I, like I said to the trustee, I know one salary employee that consistently over the last year works 45 to 50 hours a week. I told the mayor, if I was her husband, bring your butt home and I'll go get a second job because you don't need this kind of treatment. That's what you guys don't know. That's what goes on in behind them doors. And you talk about they calling the attorneys, yes, over and over. You know why? It's not their money. When you can sue, sue and spend your own money. I guarantee you they won't go to lawyers then. But when it's not your money, it's easy to spend. That's the problem. But when I bring it up, oh, Mr. Finch, you bitter, you mad. No, I ain't mad. I'm just tired of the BS. And I'm tired of hypocrisy. And I asked back in December, I asked a few months ago, leave me alone. But when you come after me, and I said it last summer, please come with your guns loaded, because my candy's going to be loaded. So if they take this personal, this meeting, oh well. There's a trustee that, that mentioned something to me last week. I didn't say your name, so you must be guilty. But now when I bring up that person who you said was doing a great job, that lets me believe you knew what he did was wrong. But you ain't never spoken to the board, you ain't never spoken to the residents, but the slight thing you think I did wrong, you want to magnify it. There's a why the trustees that been here in 2017, why did they wait to May of 2019 to ask about a surety bond? I never stole money from y'all, but the treasurer did. You had two before I got here, not one treasury bond. Not one financial director had a treasury bond. Why? But all of a sudden, Mr. Finch sitting in that seat, he got to have a treasury bond, a surety bond. I'm mean, announced to them, I brought it with me. Because I know my job, and I can do it well, and again, am I a little pissed? Yeah, I'm pissed. Because there's so much that I can do back there, and I got so much interference. There's people in our system, county system, that has no business in our county system, but they come out here and say, I'm not getting information. I personally gave that person 400 pieces of paper, and yet you still ain't getting no information. No, you're not getting the information that you think gonna indict the mayor. But again, if his name's not on it, it's the one person that you think is a great superstar that's gonna get indicted. Now, let me say this last part. I did the IMRF audit, unbeknownst to probably most of the trustees. There's also an FBI audit going on. That's going on because of something that happened in 1415. But yet, they know. Trust me, they are few, at least I know personally two of them know about it. But no one talks about that because it's going to implicate the prior administration. I don't care which administration did wrong, wrong is wrong. Exactly. Okay? Yep, go ahead. Okay. This is what I want to say. Before you transition out of South Village, if you can find some money for these vacant homes that need to be demolished, I speak on behalf of the residents. There are so many homes that have possums, raccoons, yeah. thugs, and 
drugs, stash houses in these vacant homes. If you could please, that's why I asked about the tax money that's going to be coming in. If it's already allocated and targeted for something, we, I was told that it costs $10,000 to demolish a vacant house. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's about that much. So I don't know how many vacant homes we have. I hear it's over 400, but I promise you it's at least 100 that are rotted out, not boarded up, that need to be demolished. I don't know if there's some well, grants or what we can do, but before you leave, if you could just get rid of some of these demolished homes, I would really appreciate that on behalf of the residents. Well, you, um, there, you um, kind of still in a little bit of my thunder. There, there is something that I'm working with that I have not shared with the mayor nor okay. the board. But no, that, that is in the work. And the reason I have not shared it, because I did not want to become a political issue and people block it. Because what I think what I think would happen, they would try to give it to the village administrator to run with it and it'd be delayed. There's an email that we sent out, maybe myself and a former community developer, I think maybe last November, December, to the attorney to ask for these 10 houses to be looked into. I think just maybe the last couple of weeks we have approval to get two of them taken care of, but that has been in the works. And there's something that related to a grant that I'm working with, with somebody. Um, I will share this with you. Other 300 some plus houses that we have two um, lawn care company out cutting the grass. We found that about 100, actually it's supposed to be vacant, got people in them. Of the 120 some, there's like 25 that's being listed with realtors. And there's no signs out there. So the process that the young lady who's gonna, is on vacation right now, gonna do next week, is send a letter from me to those realtors and say, here's your pass through water bill, we need it. Have him call me. Okay. To conclude on my question, have all the issues of 2018 and 2019, 2019 been resolved according to your understanding? From the audit? Yeah. No. We're not even halfway through. Okay, well, what's, uh, what would be the holdup, in your opinion? Per personnel. When you we, say personnel. We, the, the finance department needs a strong team. It needs um, people that can work together, and that um, can pretty much gel together. So like the bank, bank regulation. It's 400 bank regulation, so in a given month, you're doing about 30. Now, some of them are quite small, some of them are not. But if you're doing the bank recs and you're dealing with residents and their complaints and you're dealing with vacant houses and the investor complaints, which as you guys know, some of the investors in town really don't like any changes. We had a lawsuit on that a few recently. That takes up time because there's no level of um, respect, in my opinion level of um, I appreciate the value. It's hard to get somebody to work past eight hours and they're on salary. Because why would I give you more when I know you don't want to pay me more, not even a little bit, when I know you don't even want to pay me what the last person in the position was doing and everything was not perfect. It might have been good, but not perfect. That's the, that's the problem. When I got to Linwood, and I can only go by what I experienced. When I got to Linwood, our city hall, was outdated paint-wise. Counter was red, the setting was red. My entire staff came in on a weekend and painted the whole building. I guarantee you, nobody in this building, even for threat, can get any other young ladies to come in on a weekend. Because why would they? That's the problem. When you don't have a team working together, it's like rowing a boat. You have the front rowing this way, you have the back rowing this way, and all you're doing is going in a circle. And that's what Salt Village has been doing, going in a circle. And until it stops, you're not going to move forward. Until you stop, even if you don't like what the mayor is doing as far as a personnel, give that personnel a chance to fail. It's called a job evaluation. 90 days, do the job or don't do the job. But 
hold all department heads accountable. Don't make excuses. Like I said, I have nothing against the public works head in years, so it's not personal. It's just how you pick and choose who doing, who's worthy of this, who's worthy of that. There's a $61,000 machine, and this pisses me off because I talked about it last year not to do it. And the mayor and the board overrode my uh, opinion, and that's their right. But there's a $61,000 machine that's sitting in the building that collected dust. You want to know why your roads ain't getting fixed? Because that machine ain't moved out. But yet, if I say it, hey, Mr. Finch trying to tell me what to do. No, Mr. Finch, though not a resident of Salt Village, cares about the resident of Salt Village. Because at the end of the day, I go back to my nice house in Creek. I know if the neighbor dog barked too loud, I ain't got to worry about telling my neighbors to cut the dog, stop the dog from barking so much. The code enforcer would be there at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. And so until everybody is held accountable, until you guys make everybody accountable, until you come every week and ask the Public Safety Committee how many fire hydrants are getting fixed, it's never going to get done. Because the energy is worried and focused on the finance department. Oh, they can pay too much money. Well, when I was doing this, we was doing that. Okay, you were. But according to the audits, you weren't doing the best of the best. And that's why I think we have issues. I guess that's it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be doing this once a month because as I transition, I want you guys to know what's going on. No questions off limit. If I make mistakes, I'll own up to them. Like I said, the Treasury report, it is late. I, f I honestly forgot about it because I was spending time doing other stuff, correcting problems, um, answering. Like I'll give you an example. When I talked to Forensic Audit the other day, the word is, and I'm going to say this and I hope everybody listen, as much, no, as conceited and cocky as my wife think I may be, one thing I do not have is superhuman power. I cannot stop an audit, but yet trustees have put it in the auditor's mind that I'm trying to stop them from completing the audit until after the election. That is the farthest from the truth. I think it's inappropriate that trustees consistently, not just once and twice, but you can do it, you know, just to find out, but are consistently calling the auditors, asking, what are you at, where are you at? That's the lack of trust we have in the finance department with the finance team. Because if you know about the auditors and you know how the process works, even the mayor can't make them stop now. Because if the mayor says, we well, don't provide information to the auditors, you know what the auditors are going to do? They're going to send a letter to everybody and say, we can no longer continue this audit because we have to go somewhere else. And because of such and such delays, we're going to move on. So the word's going to come out one way or the other. So, I wish those kind of games we stop with people calling the auditors thinking that I'm trying to block it for the mayor because some gonna they trying to find what he did wrong and all that. Let it come out. Let it come out in the wash. And now finally, and I'm gonna leave this on this one. The reason that is important, relationship I built with employees and vendors. I'll give you an example. Today I call home with disposal because we had a lady move out her, clean out her condo last week. She left the dumpster last Tuesday. It got piled up with trash all over the place. It's not a village-wide dumpster. It's a personal dumpster she bought. But the other residents called and complained about it. I called my contact at home with disposal, and I asked him if you could do me a favor and go pick the dumpster up today. He said yes. He didn't say yes because he was charging Linwood. He didn't say yes because he was gonna charge the lady again. The lady is gone, she moved out. He said yes because we have a working relationship. Until you have a working relationship, things do not get done that benefit the residents. When you call vendors, it makes them nervous. The reason the audit got delayed last year was because a trustee called the auditor and said, I believe there's some stealing. Well, when you say that word, they gotta stop what they're doing and investigate because they're not gonna lose their CPA license just because you think they should, or you think they're not looking into things. They're going to investigate and make sure that thing is done correctly, which is why they're not going to finish the audit until the forensic audit is done. I say that to say, about three weeks ago, we had the audit firm come in on a Friday. Young man came in, spent all day here. Next thing I know, I'm here Tuesday morning. 
I'm told we got a meeting at one o'clock with the art firm. And I'm like, why? They were just here Friday. Oh, well I call the, the, the manager, because there's, there's different levels. I call the manager because the trustees wanted me to know what's going on with the audit. Well, that made her panic. Because in her eyes, she's like, what the hell did my employee just do to piss off Salt Village? He was just out there Friday. What happened on Monday that you feel you have to call me on a mandatory meeting at one o'clock on Tuesday? If you understand the process of how auditing work, you would know that's not appropriate. Because you should, out of consideration, ask the finance team that was here. Or more importantly, ask the mayor who was here. Or third, since you are a village administrator, you, would, you was here, you should have known that somebody else was in this village working. Those are the problems, the nuances, the, the unnecessary stuff we deal with day and day and day. So with that, I'll leave you guys. I'll do this again in October. Ask questions.